will now move into our directed Q&A, which I hope to have time to follow with questions from all of you. Um, so first, I'm going to direct my question to Irma. And I was just hoping you could help define the way that your community thinks of an artist. And then if it helps to elaborate how you decided to become an artist in your community. Creo que definitivamente que para mi comunidad ser un artista. I think that definitely for my community I am an artist. Es alguien que tiene eh, mucha carga encima. Oh, I think for her community an artist would be someone who ha who would have a lot of responsibility. Porque tiene que no solamente generar un un arte mm, hermoso como show. Because it wouldn't just be about making a a pretty show. Tiene que también ser un arte más que todo funcional. It has to be an art that is that is practical. Por favor, que me repita la segunda parte. No la entendí. Yeah, what was the second part of the question again? What inspired you to become an artist? ¿Qué inspiró a ti a ser artista? Um, definitivamente que la cultura, um, la lengua. The language and the culture. Eh, pasar eh, la parte de mi infancia escuchando mucho mucha música Past part of my uh, childhood listening to a lot of music eh, instrumentos autóctonos tinias flautas quenas traditional mus musical instruments the, f the flutes and the quenas eh, tomando chicha y danzando en varios lugares interculturales drinking chicha uh, the corn beer and dancing uh, in cultural centers y ver a cantar cada vez a mi madre and to watch her mother dance and sing also y algunos uh, uh, hombres viejos que es, normalmente casi hombres hacen poesía and uh, older men who also recite poetry y siempre lo hacen con una expresión extra emocional parece que te llevan al al, frent, al fondo de la tierra and they do it with an, with an extra expressive emotion that seems like it would bring you all the way down to the earth creo que es eso sobre todo me inspira mucho el todavía escuchar algunas fracciones de quechua para mí quechua es la poesía y lo que me inspira ¿no? Listening to Quechua inspires me. It's it's what gives me the extra uh, inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jacob. I was hoping you could also answer that question to share some similarities and differences. But from your own perspective, how is an artist defined in your community, and what inspired you to become one? I think in my community, our community uh, government actually really promotes traditional art and traditional artwork, but not just traditional, but contemporary forms of um, of art. Um, so I wouldn't say that there's one defining style of art in our community. Um, there's there's potters, there's painters. There's graffiti artists, um, and then there there are there there writers, authors. So I think uh, defining it would be hard, but I think uh, acknowledging artists in our community is something that 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 our tribe tries to do. Um, I think on an individual basis, though, uh, people that you've grown up with all your life sometimes don't realize that you do things. Uh, while I was here, I actually posted some pictures of my work, and I've known I've known this gentleman for probably about 35 years. And he's like, I never knew you did any of that. <laughs> I thought you were a gardener. <laughs> so, um, a lot of times, I think our roles are are what people see us doing every day, and our art forms are what we do um, because that's our passion. And I think uh, what inspired me to be an artist is. I think I think an artist is born an artist. I think uh, what inspired me to express it and and and, and actually pursue a, a, I guess a, a career in art um, would be that need to express something, that that need to um, to strengthen our, our sovereignty through our, our cultural heritage. 
Uh, so that's one of the reasons I, I do traditional artwork is the way it is now is if you don't practice your language, you don't speak your language or practice your culture, then there's no reason for you to be a tribe. And I think it's very vital to the sovereignty of our people to, to, to focus on retaining a lot of that. And uh, another reason is, is, like I said in my, my presentation, is for my children. So my kids can make, I mean, they, they help me make pots. They help me with my shells. And they can go to a number of different places and see my work. You know, I was, I was very grateful to, to be able to be listed to the, on the Smithsonian's artist, artist page. And so my kids are actually going to look that up tonight and see my little portfolio on there. So I think that's what drives me today. Thank you both. Um, moving on to a different line of inquiry, Anita, I was hoping you could share with us a little bit more specifically about how your art shares or transmits cultural, historical, and personal knowledge. How my art transmits information? Bueno, principalmente a través de los colores. Mostly through color. A través de la simbología. Through symbolo symbology. Nosotros nos dividimos en territorio eh, indígena. We don't uh, express our uh, ter ter indigenous territory. Eh, las personas, los mapuches que viven en la zona cordillerana eh, donde hay nieve. The Mapuches that live in the high altitudes where there's snow. Se con su color y su they identify with their own colors and their own symbologies. Que somos más de la parte central sur, no We, where she is from is more of the, the central south, and they have different colors that represent them. The people that live closer to the ocean have a different symbology and different colors. Yo lo que transmito a través de mis textiles, a través de de cada una de las piezas que, que logro hacer. What she transmits through her, her work and through the pieces that she makes. Tiene que ver muchas veces con alegri transmitir alegría, transmitir eh, has to do amor, with happiness, pasión, uh, eh, love, passion. Y también muchas veces el descontento. And also, some, also a lot of times uh, unhappiness or discontentedness. Nuestra simbología es legible y es es ser capaz de ser leída por, por gente como nosotros. Our symbology is, is uh, readable and it's, it's uh, visible and can be read by other Mapuche people. Hay símbolos que identifican netamente al ser masculino. There's, there's a symbology that represents masculinity. Y eso es algo que nosotros logramos identificar como Mapuche. And that's what they can identify as Mapuches. Nuestra misión hoy por hoy tiene que ver con enseñar a, al resto de las personas. Their mission today, today in age is to teach other people que no se puede usar cualquier simbología en, en un textil. That, they, that you can't use just any symbology in textiles. Se, lo que yo busco en el fondo es justamente eso, poder educar y, y que la gente tenga un conocimiento amplio. What she looks for in her work, in, in the essence, is that there be a, a profound and wide-ranging knowledge. De lo que nosotros como mujer mapuche eh, estamos haciendo. That them as Mapuche women are doing. Y, y bueno, en la comunidad en realidad, eh, nuestra comunidad Mapuche eh, existe ese conocimiento, pero para la gente joven aún es necesario saber. So this knowledge is, is known in, in the Mapuche community, but it's important for the young people to, to gain access to this knowledge. Gracias. And Lisa, also could you share um, your impressions of the same? Um, how is it that you are transmitting cultural, historical, and personal knowledge through your art? A lot of my art forms are based on uh, history, uh, the historic clothing, the feather capes. They go back to like 1540 at least. And um, as you said about the community, there are many communities in my community. You know, we have a lot of people that are very knowledgeable about the history and culture. Uh, my coworkers. They're very knowledgeable and um, 
they're for the most part they're really talented artists so they can make anything and I know uh, they keep I've received emails and messages since I've been here people asking me well could you find out about this could you find out about that find some examples so this gives me an avenue to share what I've learned and to those that aren't that familiar with the history and culture um, I can show them um, this is what we were really wearing. A lot of people think we were wearing the, the tear dress at the time of the Trail of Tears, and that's not so. That dress didn't come about until 1970. And uh, we were wearing the, um, the leggings, the wrap skirts, the trade shirts, um, that sort of thing in the 1700s. So my artwork gives me an avenue to bring that to people's attention and um, just to share a little bit of the history and uh, I can teach people to make some of these items, like our beadwork. Uh, it wasn't that many years ago until Martha Berry did her research and really started teaching the beadwork classes. Um, in her, her classes, she states that there were very few people that could even recognize their own grandmother's beadwork. We didn't know, a lot of people thought we didn't do beadwork. So now I can uh, study these examples in the collections here and go back and explain to them that this is a characteristic only found on Cherokee beadwork. This is what we were carrying at this time period. This is what we were doing. So I, I like to share and teach, and this gives me a good opportunity to do so. Great, thank you. Now, I would like to open this up to the whole panel, but maybe, Jacob, you could um, answer first. I was just listening to each of your answers in the previous section, and it seems that you may have um, had some challenges with your creative and conceptual process as you entered into these new new mediums and, and gaining access to resources. And I was wondering if you could share some some difficulties maybe you've had or some challenges and some, some things you have done to overcome those. Well, for, for the ceramics, we gather everything uh, from the land. So we use no tools. I think the only thing that I have uh, for a tool is a rock and a paddle. And everything else comes from, from the earth. So some of the challenges in, in gathering that is, is the, the hiking up the mountain and digging the clay. And then you see a vessel at the end, and that vessel probably took a few hours to, to make and then a few more hours to paint and then maybe another day to, to fire, but it actually represents over a month's worth of work in processing all that material and, and getting it to that point. But for these shells, it was an even greater challenge because it was a lost art form. And there was a lot of archeological theory on how the shells were created that way and even even with the saguaro wine, I, I focus on the saguaro wine because that's what's regarded as, as what was used, and I, I believe it was used. But uh, talking to a few older Otham from, from the Thon Otham Nation, they actually use another type of fruit to etch their shells. Um, there are a few people that still remember some ways that it was done, but I think those were supplemented when they didn't have the saguaro fruit. And, and the other challenge is the seasons. It's very hard to get the fruit, and it takes a lot to, to make, I believe, a, a little ounce of saguaro fruit. You need three five-gallon buckets of, uh, I mean, um, saguaro syrup. You need three five-gallons of uh, buckets of saguaro fruit. And that all reduces into a syrup. And then to etch a few shells, I use three of those ounces for about three shells so and then it takes five months to make that wine <laughs> so you can actually drink the wine in three to four days but to use it for etching shells it takes about four to five months to let it actually sit and turn old um, so the lack of availability I can't go to the, the grocery store and gather anything it all has to be harvested or traded um, to get the raw materials the shells those shells that I showed, they only come from one place in the world, and that's the Cia Cortez in uh, the Baja area of Mexico. They're not found anywhere else in the world. 
I've been offered other shells to utilize, and it just doesn't have the same meaning for me. And so um, I, I've gone down there a few times. I had a friend that would meet me in Tucson, and we would, uh, I would buy shells from him. And that, that gentleman since passed away. And so as soon as I, I leave here, I'm actually going on a trip down there to gather more shells. So it, it's very hard to source your materials. It's very hard to process your materials. But I think the hardest thing I've, I've ran into is um, using the historical accounts and what was left be behind from not only archaeologists but our ancestors on the land and trying to s find those missing pieces of that puzzle of what was actually used to to create these beautiful images on these shells is, is, is the challenge and the interest to me though. I mean, it, it's what's driving me to kind of do it because I want to do it right. And when I started, I used uh, nail polish and vinegar and it's the same chemical process and I, I have used the, the lac from the creosote. I've used brittle bush sap as a resist. I've used pine. Um, but you know what? I do have my favorite nail polish color. Uh, <laughs> That's a, I'm going to say it right now, it's a creme brulee number 915 Revlon. <laughs> and it, it's what I use uh, for the majority of my resist uh, while I'm learning this, this older form. And, and I think you go back to what you're comfortable with and um, to create the really intricate, uh, intricate design work, I, I do use that nail polish. And, uh, um, but I think the thing, the big significance is that we're using that, that Hashanawait or the Saguaro wine. And for us, that's when our New Year starts, is in, in June when the fruiting of the Saguaro um, comes about. And that's the autumn New Year, and that's why I'm going to have the class during that time, because there is a big significance there. And and, um, and I do make that wine, and so it's going to take me five months from now to, to get it ready. Great, thank you. And is there anyone else that feels led to discuss the challenges that you have with making your cultural art and how you've overcome those challenges. Irma, would you like to answer? Es, es un tanto difícil a veces atender dos lenguas, tres lenguas. It's difficult to understand different languages. Um, eh, en lo personal, en el arte que yo hago, la dificultad que he encontrado es el tema de la escritura. In personal, the work that she does, it's hard to understand the theme of the writing. Eh, hay público al que yo puedo dirigirle oralmente she can que yo hago. read the poetry, um, not read, recite the poetry orally to people who speak Quechua. Oh, pero otros quieren escrito. But other people want it written. Normalmente son los que quieren escrito son los académicos, gente people que ha aprendido a leer. The academic, more, more so the academics, people who know how to read and write in Quechua. Entonces, eh, yo estoy en ese conflicto de si escribir so she's in oralmente. the conflict of whether to write it all down or to continue the oral traditions of it. Otro conflicto que he encontrado es que hay gente que no habla quechua en Perú. There are people who don't speak quechua in Peru. Y quieren la poesía mía en español. And they want her poetry in Spanish. Y me dicen, pero hazlo en español. But they say do it in Spanish. Y yo no puedo hacerlo. And she can't do that. Ese es otro conflicto que yo he encontrado que yo no puedo ser poeta ni puedo tener creación en español. Can't be a poet or be creative in Spanish. Para mí es otro trabajo. Because it's a sí, different work. Yo no puedo no puedo ahorita crear en español. And she can't even till now create anything in Spanish. Ese sería creo mi conflicto para crear arte, el tipo de arte That's que like hago, the ¿no? conflicts within her about the work that she's doing. And are there uh, ways that you are overcoming that? Hay algunas formas que has encontrado para superar esos problemas. Eh, la tecnología es una gran ayuda. Technology is, is a big help. Eh, estoy haciendo eh, audio poemas. She's doing audio poems. 
Entonces puedo expresarlo mi voz, so pero express the, her voice. abajo tener texto en quechua para los que quieran leer. Y subtítulos en español or para alguien que quiera ayudar en español. Esa es mi solución por el momento. That's her solution for now. Thank you. Now, I would like to ask Lisa if you could share with us how you feel about your art in museums and um, gallery exhibitions where it might be next to European and American arts compared to just Native art yes, exhibitions. I like the diversity. I like to. Um, I like to see different art forms, and in fact, in the collections, I've actually been looking at feather capes from other cultures. Um, I want to see how they're put together, what type of feathers they're using, uh, what type of netting, and if it's on cloth, or how the feathers are attached. So I like being exposed to different art from different cultures, and I've really enjoyed uh, being around the, my other panelists in the program this week and learning from them, because there are a lot of similarities. And a lot of the discussions we have, one of the other artists will say, you know, we have the same thing, we experience the same situations. So I think it's a really good thing. Diversity is nice. It does share similarities and differences. There's it a lot to learn from it. Anita, I was wondering if we could take that question in a little bit of a different direction. I was wanting to know if you could share how you feel about your art being shown in museums and what purpose you would hope it has. She thinks that any artist would be very happy to see their work in a museum. That's what everyone hopes for. Me gusta. Siento que es una forma de mostrar a los demás mi arte, mi pueblo, mi gente, mi cultura. She likes this because it would be a way to share and to um, make real that her people, her language, her culture. Creo que es, me siento bien. <laughs> she, would, she would feel good. La segunda pregunta de uh, Sobre tu arte en un museo, como... Was that it, just about how would it be for her to have her art in a museum? And also, what Which purpose you would hope your art has when other people see it in yeah. a museum? O sea, el, el propósito que esperarías que sirve tu obra cuando otra gente lo ve. Uh, people who aren't Mapuche, right? Uh, she can choose to interpret that how she chooses. Either Mapuche people seeing o their own Mapuche culture. O no Mapuche viendo tus obras en el museo, ¿qué, qué practicalidad? Qué? Uh -huh. um, yo siento que si un Mapuche ve mi obra en un museo, va a sentir el mismo orgullo que yo siento. If a Mapuche person sees her work in a museum, they would feel the same pride that she feels. Es en, bueno, he sentido que existe un gran conocimiento por mi cultura. She feels that there's a great uh, knowledge of Cam her culture. Caminando acá por el museo, eh, varias personas se han acercado a mí y al verme con mi vestimenta tradicional me Cam han dicho Mapuche. Walking in the Mapuche. museum here, a lot of people have pulled, you know, seen her and said, hey, you're from the Mapuches. Y eso es porque de alguna forma hemos hecho ruido, hemos hecho sentido estar acá. And that's uh, maybe because also that she was able to uh, tell a lot of people that she would be here. Por lo tanto, espero seguir mostrando mi, mi arte, mi cultura, como, como lo he hecho hasta ahora. And she'd be uh, very happy to continue sharing her culture and her art as she has until now. Creo que ahora cuento con más herramientas para seguir trabajando. She feels that now she has more tools with which to continue working. Y hacer que más gente conozcan de mí. And that more people would know about her. Right, which brings us to the Artist Leadership Program. And I would like to ask a question which maybe, Lisa, you could start with, and just how the Artist Leadership Program has helped you to make art relevant to your community. And um, 
if your research here has spun your art into new directions? I think it really has. I think when I get home, I've got a lot of new ideas of things I want to do, but it's been very exciting to be able to come here and uh, do research. And um, as I said, I'm researching other cultures' artwork as well as Cherokee. So I've, I've got a lot of ideas to share with my uh, group back home. It's just a really exciting opportunity. Um, it's just a thrill to be able to be here and to see some of these items in the collections that we have studied in books, and I'm very familiar with them, and then in, we go down in the collections and open the drawer, and there's one of this, these items that I've just read about, so it's really exciting. Uh, it's gonna change my artwork, I think. Um, I have a notebook I've been keeping, so I've been drawing in it, writing in it, I've got all these sketches and different ideas of things that I wanna try, so. I think it's really going to change my artwork up a little bit. <coughs> Thank you, Lisa. Jacob, do you have thoughts on that as well? How has the artist leadership program to help support you in making artwork relevant to your community? And has your research here <coughs> spawned new ideas and directions for your art? Well, from just keep this here <laughs> for the relevancy it, it was awesome to be able to, to look through the archives and I'm going home with over a thousand pictures to reference and, and to share with my community and I was given journals and copies of journals that, that spoke about our community in 1902 1903 and the way the community looked at that time when I was reading it is like it's hard to imagine that that's what it looked like. And so for me, it was, it was really moving and I feel really grateful to be able to, to be able to take that home and tell the staff say, use it for whatever you want. It's, it's for your community. It's for them to learn and to grow from. And uh, you know, I, I feel real deeply for that. I, I really appreciated it. And this artist leadership program has also given me the opportunity to, to get a, a larger group of my community members together to teach a class that will have some, some lasting impact in, in this art form within our people. And, and through this, this workshop, I've been able to speak to elders of our community and outside of our community that are gonna come and talk about the history of Shell with our people. And so that's something that, that wouldn't have happened without this class. Um, and then understanding connections and, and the way that um, to have contacts and, and, and to work with other people and is, is awesome. I would have never made any of these contacts with the people on this, on this panel here and if it wasn't for this leadership program. Um, I mean, the Smithsonian is it's the Smithsonian. <laughs> no, it's it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to to view a collections the way that we viewed them this this past few weeks and to really just take it all in and absorb it and and, and I don't even know if I processed all that. So uh, I, I just I have an immense uh, amount of of gratitude for being here. Definitely look forward to see the new directions you go with <laughs> your collection. Anita, if you would like to share how the Artist Leadership Program has helped you make art for your community and with your community. Bueno, yo en el 2001 tuve la oportunidad de conocer parte de la colección. In 2001, she had the opportunity to get to know part of the collection. Y fue muy en en ese donde hay, muy que han a nuestro, a nuestros antepasados. It was very emotional and exciting for her to go into the space where, uh, where, where the older pieces of her culture are kept. Fue inevitable no sentir escalofríos. It was inevitable not to, it was inevitable to feel um, 
um, the hair stand up on her, on her eh, conociendo parte de esa colección es que yo me propuse la, la idea de, de venir y, y buscar a través de, de, de estos textiles eh, los símbolos so that, that, so from that first visit is when she felt the need to try to come back and look through there and with the, with the goal of um, investigating the, symbol, the symbols. En, creo que en eso el programa ha sido bastante bueno para mí. In that aspect, the program has been very good for her. Porque de alguna forma estoy cumpliendo mi sueño. Because somehow, through one way or the other, she's completing her dreams. Que de alguna forma tiene que ver justamente con llevar nuevamente eh, toda esta iconografía. Which has to do with uh, beginning to work again with the iconographies. A mi gente y también poder people, replicar algunas piezas. And to be able to reproduce some of the objects, some of the techniques that she's seen. Creo que también eh, dentro de este programa encontrarme con, cuatro, eh, con tres compañeros. And to be able to meet with the other people in the, in the group. Me he dado cuenta también que tenemos ciertas similitudes en cuanto a, a costumbres, en cuanto a, a también parte del, del, de la forma en cómo ellos se relacionan entre, entre su propia gente. And to be able to see that there are certain things in, in common, uh, ways of relating to each other, um, maybe group ways of, of how uh, people interact. Tenemos muchas cosas en común. We have a lot of things in common. A pesar de la diferencia en despite the differences de, de, de lugar donde vivimos, of place bueno, con Irma somos más cercana. even though with Irma it's, it's closer the place Pero por ejemplo, con Lisa, eh, eh, tenido, tenido la with Lisa they were able to share a bit of their experiences Ella habla del natural, cosa que they both use natural dyes en la simbología que usa eh, Jacob en las conchas que él trae. Eh, simbología que Jacob usa en his in the shells. También he encontrado eh, simbología que es muy parecida a la nuestra. And simbology that's very close uh, in nature to the Mapuche. Creo que este programa eh, me ha servido justamente para encontrar toda esa información. She thinks that the program has uh, been very important for her to be able to find th that information. Y ponerla en práctica con mi gente que está dispuesta and put it in practice with her people who are, who are very happy to, to have this information to use it. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. And there, Ma, if you too could share how your research here has helped inspire the direction you will go with your art from here forward. Primero, gracias a José Antonio. El, Thank you to Jose Antonio. El, el guía que tuve en ver las colecciones. The, the guide who helped show her through the collections. Mm -hmm. Había un momento en que me llevó a la parte donde están las la ecología, donde están las cerámicas antiguas. There was a moment where he brought her to the collections where there are the ancient ceramics. Y yo tenía miedo, no podía tocar. And she was scared. No podía acercarme. And couldn't go near them and couldn't touch them or see them. Pero José Antonio es de Bolivia y él sabe cómo tiene que romper ciertos hielos que nosotros tenemos. José Antonio es de Bolivia y él entendió cómo would be importante to break some ice that people have. Simplemente me dijo, toca, es tuyo. He said, touch it, it's yours. Eh, fue muy impactante para mí tener tan cerca un elemento que yo consideraba tan importante. It was very impactful for her to have so close an element that she can, would consider so important. Y experiencias similares he tenido con la visita a diferentes otros lugares de la colección. And the same experience in different ways with different parts of the collection. He podido escuchar, por ejemplo, la voz de un poeta viejo de allá de Cusco. She was able to hear the voice of an old poet from Cusco. Grabado en un cassette de esos antiguos. Recorded in those uh, old uh, cassettes. Yo siempre había visto en texto por aquí por allá sus poemas y su enseñanza. She had always seen his texts, the poems that he left behind. Pero pude escucharlo en el cinta. But I had never heard his voice before. 
ese tipo de cosas creo que impactan fuertemente en mi, en mi ser uh, y estoy seguro que ahora retornando voy a compartir esto con las personas con quienes yo voy a tener contacto And she's sure that going back to Peru, she will be able to share those things with the people she will be in contact with. También es importante mencionar que es muy agradecida. So she's always, she's also wanting to mention that she's very thankful. Esta oportunidad me ha permitido ver las cosas eh, de los pueblos nativos de aquí. To be able to have seen the some objects of the native peoples of here, of up here in the north. La gente nativa, quechua, aymara, mucha gente común, the no tiene acceso. People, the quechua, the aymara, a lot of people don't have access. Entonces, para mí, eh, mirar cosas que tenemos en similitud. So to see things that are similar. En muchísimas cosas, en los colores de las cerámicas, en los textiles. In the colors of the ceramics and the textiles. En los instrumentos de música. In the musical instruments. Yo digo, somos lo mismo en realidad. Helped her to see that we're the same. La espiritualidad. That the spirituality is the same. Estoy muy agradecida porque tengo muchísima información en mi corazón, sobre todo. She's very thankful because she has all this information in her heart. Para poder compartirlo allá. To bring and share there in Peru. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want to say thank you, muchas gracias, to our distinguished panel, and I'd now like to open it up to all of you in case you have some questions you would like to direct to any of the artists, and I'll be coming around with a microphone. Is there anyone who has a question? Um, my name is Grant Breville from Australia, yes, and I've got um, 10 Aboriginal students traveling with with myself today. We've been here for a week and uh, we've been studying the Smithsonian and in particular um, the kind of political nuances about being Aboriginal in this world. And I was just interested in how you negotiate the critical political world in your work uh, given the plight of Indigenous uh, rights in the world and whether you see any urgency in your work about being political. Thank you. Um, the, the photo of the sunrise, um, they showed the mountain range. Or that's just a portion of our, our Altum Juven. So that's just a portion of the land that we've always lived on. And that 57,000 acres is just a, a boundary that was placed upon us. So our people extend from the Mogion Rim all the way down to the Sierra Cortez. And our, our people were living all up and down Arizona. And so then when they started doing the Allotment Act, they they put a boundary around us. Uh, and then they said, you have sovereignty over that land. Um, but for us, I think your language and your your culture is very, very deeply rooted in what makes you a tribe and makes you a, pe a people that is distinct and separate from from everybody else. And that's what entitles you to, to have what you have. And I think there's a big cultural loss that's occurring all over, all over the world with, um, with modern technology kind of being in the forefront of, of, of everybody's lives and uh, our traditional ways are kind of getting pushed back. Um, they say when 10% of the people stop speaking their language, that language is already at risk of being dead. And so in most communities, there's less than 10% of the people that speak that language. So what does that say for that language and that culture that, that that is driven by it. Um, so I, that's one of the reasons that, that I do a lot of my work and that's one of the reasons I try to te keep a, a, like real traditional design work and um, elements in, my, in, in everything that I do because it reflects us as individuals as well as a, a distinct and diverse separate cultural identity 
that help strengthen our, our sovereignty. And so the, the more people that can identify and know where they came from, then they'll better be prepared. They'll be better prepared to, to know where they're going. And so through my work, that's what I try to influence. And I try to influence the people that work with me um, to do the same thing, to acknowledge those, those strengths that we have as individuals and, and those strengths that, that that we have in our heritage to to promote those things and 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 continue being distinct and and and, and more like into our, ourselves. Um, it's good to take technology and utilize it, but if if it's um, at a loss to your culture, then it's I don't, I don't think it's very good for you. I think there needs to be that balance. Would anyone else like to take that question? Es interesante. Aymar, thank you. It's very interesting. Como uno puede eh, ser dueño de casa, tener eh, todo, ¿no? Tu ropa, tu tierra. How you could be a owner of a house and have everything, have your land, your, your clothing, your house. Tu ropa, tus padres, todo. Your parents. Y, y cómo es posible que hasta ahora pueda eh, un visitante llegar a casa yeah, a, a, a y te diga esta no es tu casa esta no es tu ropa esta no es tu tierra no es tu agua tus padres no sirven son lo peor is, y tu lengua es vergonzoso es más o menos en resumen un contexto en el que durante años ha luchado eh, a, 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 la gente nativa de Sudamérica. That would be a, a summary of what the people of South America have fought against. Ese lado ese lado tragédico, ese lado tragédico. That's the tragic side. Pero eh, es eh, bueno saber que las políticas de Estado, sobre todo, están poco a poco cambiando. It's good to know that the politics of the state in Peru are slowly changing. Estoy eh, casi al feliz eh, de poder estar en, en este tiempo y en esta generación She's siendo mujer. Happy to be in this generation, in this time, porque, porque si hubiera nacido una generación atrás, en la de mi madre, because, la de mi abuela, porque si hubiera nacido una o dos generaciones Before that, in the time of her mother or the time of her grandmother, hubiera sido muy terrible. It would have been much, much worse for life. Eh, hay políticas lingüísticas que se están dando en papel, en Congreso y en todo. There are linguistic um, uh, ru uh, rules or policies that are being passed in, in the Congress of Peru. Pero falta en la práctica But aplicarlos. These, all, these all stay on paper and never get. Por ejemplo, una cosa, get, you know, into algo para respetar a los pueblos nativos, indígenas, como quiera llamársele, debería enseñarse, por ejemplo, la lengua quechua, que es la lengua que yo hablo, en las escuelas, en todo. Teach, uh, Ese es un derecho elemental, por ejemplo, right. que todavía no se está cumpliéndose bien, aren't, aren't al menos en Perú. En Perú. Unless someone else is uh, burning to s answer that question, I'll open it up to s the audience again. Does someone else have something you would like to ask? This, this question sounds very small <laughs> in comparison. I was wondering about the, um, the method that Jacob mentioned. Um, the paddle and anvil style, how is that different than other uh, pottery styles? A lot of the, a lot of the potters that, that are like um, from the Pueblos and a lot, a lot of potters that we run into, um, they do a coil method. So they, they roll out a large coil and then they start to form a shape of a pot. And then, so there's a, a series of coils that form that pot. And then they get a scraper and they scrape the outer Um, surface of that pot and the inner, uh, the interior of the pot to get the thi uh, the thickness or the thinness that they want, um, and that's basically how how they form a, a vessel. The way that we do it is we start with a a, a massive of clay, 
and we pat it down into a, a patty and then we start with the mold and we use our paddle to start to shape that. And then once it gets to uh, a bottom of a pot, then we'll put it in our hand, place it on our, on our lap, and we'll use our anvil. So if, uh, if I had a rock a lot larger than this, something kind of like, like the base of this microphone, I would put that on the, the interior of the vessel and I would paddle it and pull that clay to form one continuous or one solid vessel. So there's no coils or no links. It's one mass, uh, solid mass that, that forms a, a pot. Uh, and then when you get to the top, you have to add one more coil of, of, of clay to finish finish it off. But um, it's very different than, than stacking coils to form a pot. Um, it's very hard. <laughs> and I think, yeah, it's time consuming, but it's hard to keep your vessel, um, your vessel's form because as you're paddling over here, this, the weight of it's moving. And, and so it takes a, deg a degree of skill. And I think that's one of the reasons there's not a lot of people that, that try it because it, it is, it's a struggle. And it's something that, that's, um, that if you took ceramics or you, you did it on a wheel, it's a little easier. And so um, it, it is, it, a lot of people expect to make a, a pot the way that we make them the first time out and we tell them that there's a progress or a transition that you have to go through. Um, there's a curve. <laughs> and so if I, I look at a bunch of the pots that I made when I, when I first started and I have a hard time admitting that they're mine <laughs> because they don't look like the ones that I make today. And it is, it's a, it's a skill that you have to learn and it's, it's, it's something that you have to apply yourself to. We maybe have time for one more question. Okay, well, thank you all for coming, and thank you again to our thank distinguished you. panel. Please give them one more round of applause.